Hi everyone, welcome to our ninth week of classes, CSC 316. Uh, today we'll talk about JSON and AJAX and more generally about semi-structured data. And then we'll actually talk a little bit about uh, uh, the homework and uh, uh, project for this class. So until now we talked about relational databases and JSON and actually before JSON XML was a different direction uh, towards uh, non-structured databases and what is known today as NoSQL or not only SQL. So around 2000 uh, ish, uh, a new era in uh, uh, databases started called the semi-structured era. And this is something that we covered before when we talked about history of uh, database management systems, that it had multiple ideas. One was the fact that the schema doesn't have to be decided on at the beginning of the project. Uh, and data can be self-describing. Basically, each uh, attribute can have the name of that attribute. So a person has a name that is Joe Jones, wages uh, 14.75 an hour and so on and not all data fields are available uh, for other people so uh, one person may have hobbies stated another person may have favorite coffee stated and so on so it was basically a grow uh, a response to the growth of uh, web services in particular, uh, uh, RESTful Web Services and AJAX. XML was the original language, which basically was a structured way to send information over the web in a textual format. And JSON is basically what is used today and what we will actually learn today in this class. Uh, and really it was a way to avoid the fact that relational databases uh, were heavyweight mechanisms. You had to create a table, you have to decide on the schema before even starting the project. Changing that schema is quite hard. Uh, basically, you would have to alter the table, add a column, and now provide values for all of those additional attributes. And XML and JSON, had basically advantages that were not available in relational databases. For instance, the fact that records can be hierarchical, uh, rec records can be composed. You basically can have a record that has an attribute, which is a record itself, a more complex object. You didn't have to use a different table with foreign keys to access that second record. Records, even in these complex objects, they can be referred from other records through paths. And when we learn about XML, we learn about XPath, XQuery, and uh, style sheets to actually modify and present XML in different ways, even in HTML. Uh, the idea being that schema can be defined later. For instance, in XML, you can define later the uh, XML schema is the current standard for defining the schema or a DTD document. Now, also the fact that for machine consumption, data should have a bunch of characteristics which are not uh, basically relational in, in essence. They have to be object-like. Basically, person may have, uh, should have attributes, name, uh, hobbies, and so on, schema-less, not guaranteed to conform exactly to any schema, but different objects may have some commonality among themselves and be self-describing that attributes are preceded by the attribute name. And that's part of the data itself. Data with these characteristics are referred as semi-structured. Okay. So non-self-descripting data, relational database or object-oriented databases where you have a schema part uh, where the schema basically defines what are the attributes and the domains of those attributes for any object of the class person. And in such basically schemas, you have a fixed table declaration, and then you basically define the data, even if without specifying for which attribute, because you are using that exact uh, schema. Uh, 
and as an evolution of databases, self-describing uh, languages like XML first and then JSON uh, include the attribute name in the data itself. And we can see in this example where uh, a list of students contains all of these different objects, uh, a person with the name John Doe with ID, address, another person with name, ID, address, and so on. So it's self-describing the object itself actually has the attribute names and they may be different. So that brings us to JSON. So JSON is the prevalent uh, data exchange format in uh, web, web applications today. It stands for JavaScript Object Notation. It's very lightweight text-based data interchanged. It's not binary, it's text-based is mainly used with RESTful APIs and AJAX, asynchronous JavaScript and XML. And this is what you are going to actually learn today. So first, the data types of JSON maps to the data types of uh, JavaScript. You have numbers, which can be integers or floating point numbers. They don't have separate types. Uh, it's just a string, a string version of uh, JSON uh, of JavaScript data types. So basically numbers exactly as you would write them into a JavaScript file. Strings are sequences in, of characters within quotes, single quotes or double quotes. Uh, Boolean could be true or false. Array, an ordered list. Basically, it's a sequence of elements. They are also called lists. They are within brackets. Objects, which are basically uh, the curly brace set notation and then name value pairs, like we had for objects in JavaScript. And then you have null, a non, an empty non-existent value. So first, the syntax is quite simple. Data in uh, JSON uh, objects are key value pairs. And you basically have to have a key, which is a string. The key must be quoted and the value. And the value may be one of the described data types that I stated before. A file that contains JSON can actually, uh, must be with extension, should be with extension .json. Uh, the type, the MIME type for that uh, type, uh, for that file, and this is used for web applications, is application JSON. Now, before we get into an example, I will give you sim uh, uh, the simple uh, commands that are used in AJAX. And in AJAX, an HTTP, XML HTTP request, ready state, can have any one of the possible values. And we have zero for unsent, one for opened, two for header received, three for loading and four for done. And for HTTP uh, replies, uh, responses, you basically have the code 200 for done. That means that the file, the, the request was loaded and is now available. And this is actually uh, used in the next JSON example with Ajax. So first we have a simple JSON file that defines that people, one uh, uh, key has an array of values and each one of the elements in that array are actually also JSON objects. So we have one person with the name Tony and age 55, another person with the name Tina and age 35, and another person with the name Joe and age 10. Then we have an HTML file, I call it JSON3, which basically what it does it does an AJAX request. So XHTTP is a new XML HTTP request. And I basically define the response on ready uh, state change, which basically is that there was a state change in loading this HTTP request, which will actually be used below, we we'll see here. So here we just created that object. Now we basically state that when the state changes of, for that HTTP call, uh, we are going to execute the following function. So every time the state changes to another one of these states, uh, if the current state is in state four, which basically was that the operation was completed, we got the response from the server and the status is done for the same object. That was the same, the sec second HTTP status. 
uh, then we basically parse the, re the response. So uh, it, a typical action is to actually uh, write in the console the response text. Then we get the response. So for that XHTTP response text, we parse it as, X, uh, as uh, JSON in this example. So JSON.parse takes a string uh, that basically represents a JSON file like the one that we have here. And you get as a, res a result back a uh, uh, JavaScript object with exactly those values that we had before. So now we get the people uh, value. So from that response that we created, people is a variable that has this array of people. For all the integers between zero and the length of that array, the output, which is a string that I created as empty before, is concatenated with uh, the person's name and uh, as a new item, uh, uh, list item. Now, we are going to populate that those uh, list items into the uh, element with ID people and basically we'll present the result out. Okay. So the next command that I'm actually doing is to get that JSON file from the server. So with the uh, HTTP command get, we basically invoke the server uh, to basically re uh, read and return the people JSON file and we send that request to the server. So basically what happens every time the state changes for this Ajax call, it will basically invoke this function. And when the state becomes done, both as HTTP uh, call and uh, as a successful uh, ready state, we basically parse the JSON file and we present the result. This is a standard example of uh, Ajax. So. I will basically show it to you in Visual Studio. Here we I created this JSON file that contains those people that I showed you before. Uh, JSON tree is basically that uh, HTML file that defines a body of an HTML that uh, creates a new HTTP request, XML HTTP request. I'm invoking that request below to get the JSON file for people and I'm sending that request to the server, the same server that hosts uh, json3.html. And you can see that they are basically in the same directory. And then within the function that executes, uh, that basically populates the people uh, uh, unnumbered list, I basically parse the JSON file, the JSON object, and I populate the people uh, ID. This is all things that we covered before. So now if we want to actually see it in action, it does exactly what we, what we saw. So the source code is basically what we just did, an Ajax call that grabs the people JSON and parses it in the output. And we'll learn all of these utility functions. We'll learn what parse does, what stringify does, is the opposite of parsing. If you have a JavaScript object, you can basically transform it into a string uh, conforming to the JSON notation. We'll learn a lot of JSON functions in the next uh, slides if I basically respond first the questions. So what does the status 200 signify? Successful HTTP request, done. So if you follow the links that I put here, this is a link to a Mozilla uh, uh, help page, basically contains the various, uh, what each one of those 200 okay, basically means that uh, the get, uh, the resource has been fetched and it, it was transmitted in the message body, okay? Response text is just in my example, this is not, uh, Oh, this is HTML. So response text. Basically, what I'm it, it's uh, for that HTTP request. Every request has a request and a response. Response text is just the text version of that response. So in our case, it's the entire text that was contained in the JSON in the people.json file. Okay. Good. So. Now let's learn 
basically what JSON parse and JSON stringify do. So JSON parse reads a string as a JSON string. And so basically you parse in a string. Let me be more specific. This is a string and you want to stringify an object, JavaScript object. So JSON parse basically takes in a string as a JSON uh, object and uh, generates the corresponding JavaScript object for the content of that string. Stringify does exactly the opposite, converts the data or that JavaScript object into JSON notation. So JSON parts reads Java, uh, JSON strings and converts them to objects used by JavaScript and uh, Actual syntax may have multiple parameters. So we have the string and we have a function, which is an optional parameter uh, to convert or modify objects. And this is called the reviver function. I have an example for this too. So let's assume that we basically have the same example as before with the same Ajax request. And now instead of just parsing the object as a, a, a JavaScript object and returning it into response, we actually pass a function that for every key value pair in that uh, JSON uh, response, uh, if the key is age, we increment the value with 10. So instead of Tony being 55, now it's 65. So once we capture that output, everything else is the same. Basically, we'll just output the, uh, the, that object with the age incremented with 10. So really this is just a function. And in this case, I'm not defining the function separately. I will define it separately for another example later. But in this function, I basically just use the arrow notation to create an anonymous function that adds 10 to the value for uh, if the key is h, okay? And that example is basically here. And you can basically see the results. Everything is basically the same as before, only that now we are modifying the object uh, uh, using basically a reviver function. Uh, can you do to add the value, value plus, uh, can you, we do value, value plus 10? I'm not exactly sure, Kevin, what you're asking and how to modify it. Okay. Okay. So stringify. This basically converts the JavaScript data or object into the correct JSON syntax with uh, double quotes around the attribute name. And basically it uh, follows the JSON uh, syntax. And again, it has various uh, require uh, basically inputs. We can just pass the object, but if we want the last two arguments, uh, we can pass the replacer. It's a similar function to reviver and space. So these two are optional. The value is the data to be converted. The replacer is either a function that alters the behavior of stringify by selecting properties that are included. So basically an enumeration of the properties to include or not, or an array of uh, strings that uh, are used to filter, select which properties to stringify or include. So basically it, uh, it contains a way to select which properties to stringify and which not. The space, is either a number up to 10 to indicate how many spaces to use between elements. So basically in this JSON file, uh, it's kind of like a pretty printer. You specify between the various elements, how many spaces to use or a string up to 10 characters long used as the space separator. So like for instance, if you want to have new lines, you can pass in a new line character and that will basically be used for uh, stringifying that JSON. It's kind of like a pretty printer, okay? And here is an example. So in this example, I basically define 
in uh, within the current function, uh, uh, which basically responds to the Ajax call, a new function replacer. So replacer is a new function that takes a key and a value. And if the key is the name, it increments a counter with one. I started with the counter zero and it returns as the value, the value plus count. And that will be the value returned for that key. So basically what it does in this simple example, it adds a counter to the names. So Tony will be uh, concatenated with one, Tina with two, Joe with three and so on. Everything else in this uh, uh, Ajax uh, function is the same with the exception that stringify basically takes the replacer function as an input, as the second input. So for every person in people that will be stringified. So this people is actually, actually the result that we got from uh, parsing the input, uh, the JavaScript input. So we took the same JSON object that I basically got as a, a result from uh, the Ajax call. And I create a new people object, which is the result of stringifying uh, the response that I got back as people and the replacer that modifies the names with the, uh, the attribute name with uh, adding a counter to each one of them. So this is a string, new people, and then I'm parsing it back into an object final people. So basically I stringify the JavaScript object into JSON and then the JSON object, the, the JSON string into JavaScript object. And the output is constructed the same way as I did it before. Basically it's a concatenation of the different people that I, uh, that I basically have in that JSON object. So this last example is basically, uh, it runs exactly as expected. Okay, so Ryan is, says that he tested it and it doesn't work. Uh, I just wrote these in the lecture notes and they do work. So probably you would have, ah, I see uh, your test, you tested Kevin's proposal. Okay, thank you very much. So yeah. Uh, you need to do it the way that I stated it with a function that basically takes the mapping and returns the object. Okay. Now, uh, uh, this is all that I wanted to tell you about JSON and Ajax today. It's just the context of why JSON is important and is used today in Ajax for actually updating web pages asynchronously. So one thing to actually see is all of this is asynchronously. Basically when you are calling that page, what this true stands for is the fact that it doesn't wait to get the response back. So you're basically making a call to the server. It immediately finishes from the point of view of the uh, JavaScript in the client and it continues executing the rest of the code. It sends and finishes whatever the else is in that web page after that script. So this, the fact that this is done asynchronously is very important that this now this is an event programming uh, object that waits for state changes in uh, that HTTP request. Okay. Now I have more to talk about XML, much more to talk about XML is much more structured than JSON. But before I do that, I want actually to save the recording for Jason. <laughs>